equals 4, P equals 2K is, is, uh, is done. So today we discuss topics related to massive products and the massive vanishing conjecture, but not the conjecture, strictly speaking. So, okay, let us begin. Suppose F is a field. And, well, Hilbert 90 tells us that H1F uh, F sep star is a zero. Okay, so this is a fundamental result in Galois cohomology. Um, we can combine this with the Kummer sequence. The Kummer sequence is the following sequence, short exact sequence. One, mu m, f sub star, f sub star. One, so this map is given by multiplication by m. And let's assume that the characteristic of f does not divide m. Okay, so here mu m is the kernel of this map. That means it's the m, the, the mth root of unity in, in uh, f sep. So mu m uh, sometimes is also called as, so as a Galois module, as an abelian group, this is uh, cyclic of order m, but it has an action which is not necessarily trivial, and it's usually denoted by this one, okay? Um, Okay, so in any case, if we take a Galois cohomology of this sequence and combine with Hilbert 90, we get H1F mu m is F star mod F star to the m. Okay, and in particular, if, if we take a prime different from the characteristic of F, then uh, then the, the reduction map from, from mu p to the n plus one coefficients to mu p to the n. So this reduction map, well, it's, we can describe it explicitly. It is, it is this map. It is just the, the map between these two quotient groups induced by the identity of f star. So it is surjective. So this is surjective map. Okay, so as a consequence of Hilbert 90 and Kummer sequence, this, we, we always have a surjection um, uh, there. Okay, so this is the, this setup, I guess, is called Kummer theory. Um, so, and the, the question that I want to address now, so I will put, for now it's a vague question, but I will make it precise later, is the following. Is the massive vanishing conjecture uh, a consequence of, uh, let's say, Hilbert 90 or Kummer theory. So this of this of this situation here. So is this is this all we need to prove the massive vanishing conjecture? Of course, we don't even know if the massive vanishing conjecture is true. So what I mean more precisely is the cases that we know. Can we prove them only using Kummer theory? Okay, so for now, this is a vague question. I want to make it more precise. Um, so so let's, let us make it more precise. So let's fix a prime number p. And I want to say that a p-oriented, so this is a definition of p-oriented uh, profinite group uh, yeah, or pair. So what's a p-oriented profinite group? Well, it's a pair. The first entry is a profinite group, gamma. And the second entry, so gamma is profinite. And theta is a, is a homomorphism from gamma to zp cross, the units in zp. And it should be a continuous homomorphism, where we have the p-adic topology on zp hat, zp star. OK? so. So if we have this, so what is a pure anti profinite group? It's just a profinite group with some extra datum, a homomorphism. Um, what is, um, well, in this situation, we can define ZP1. So what, this is a, a continuous gamma module. So as an abelian group, it's just ZP. But gamma acts on it. Uh, so gamma acts um, on ZP1 uh, via the, so acts. 
uh, via theta. So we have gamma, uh, zp cross, and then zp cross, of course, acts on zp by scalar multiplication. And this is, this is the action that I consider on zp1. OK, if we have zp1, then we have z mod p to the n1 for every n. This will just be zp1 divided by modulo p to the n zp1. OK? So these are supposed to play the role of mu n in this, um, in this uh, scenario. Um, so OK, so in, in this situation, what does it mean to, to have Kummer theory? Well, here is the, a formal definition that we, you can give. So uh, our, our p-oriented profinite group satisfies formal Hilbert 90. So this is the definition. If for every uh, gamma prime in gamma open, some open subgroup, um, we have that surjection. So H1 gamma prime z of p to the n one surjects onto the same thing with just ZP, Z mod P. OK, so if this is surjective for all n, at least one. OK, of course, here I should say that um, here I only stated the surjectivity for, for gamma, right, for, for at the level of gamma f, the absolute Galois group of f, but an open subgroup of gamma will correspond to a finite extension. And we, have, we also have Kummer theory for the extension. We have it for every field. So indeed, this is true for all. This will be true for all uh, open subgroups. OK. So um, let's see. So let me make uh, some, one brief remark. So the definition. Right, exactly, because there I wrote n plus 1 n here, just one, but remark, thank you, yeah, I, I forgot that, yeah, but thank you, I, this is exactly the remark. The, in fact, we have surjectivity, so if it satisfies, if you have formal Hilbert 90, then, then you have the same thing. For all n. And in fact, you even have this, so you have this surjectivity for all n. Well, one, also zero. And, um, and not, not even that, but you can show that you have surjectivity at the level of uh, co-chains. So by this I mean inhomogeneous co-chains. Um, and in fact, we have this surjectivity here. So this is not, this is a, some diagram trace. It's a simple exercise. I'm going to skip it. OK. So these are inhomogeneous cochains in OK, let me give a, the main example as I hinted at already, the main example is Galois groups of fields. So we can take gamma to be gamma f, the absolute Galois group of a field f. And now we can take theta. Let's say that the characteristic is not p. Then I'm going to take theta to be the cyclotomic character. So I look at the action of gamma f on, on the p power roots of unity, and that's, that gives me my co-character. Um, so in this case, z mod p to the n1 is really just mu p to the n. OK, what, what if uh, the characteristic is equal to p? Then I can just take theta equals 0. So f equals p. So I won't, I won't care as much about the equal characteristic case. Um, 
Uh, yeah, trivial, yeah, sorry. So, so yeah, why? thanks. Yeah. And, and in this case, zima p to the n1 is just zp. Okay, so now we can make the question more precise. Question, the precise version of the vague question above. Uh, suppose that, uh, so suppose that um, gamma theta is p-oriented and satisfies formal Hilbert 90. Okay? So does, um, the massive, does the massive vanishing conjecture hold for, for, for gamma? Okay, so namely, if you have a massive product um, for it, of at least three elements and you know it it's defined, does it vanish? Okay. So, and of course, as I said, it doesn't, so the question is, makes sense, but we, we wonder about this question, especially in those cases where we already know the massive vanishing conjecture for fields. If you can prove this, then you also prove massive vanishing conjecture for fields, thanks to this example. So, okay, so this is, this is our theorem. Uh, we try to reprove as much as possible of massive vanishing only using formal hyper 90. And this is where we got. So, so the answer is yes. If uh, n equals three and uh, p is arbitrary, or the other case is n equals four, p equals two. This would be the, the optimal result in view of what we know for fields, but we can only do the degenerate case. So degenerate case, this means that we consider massive products chi one, chi two, chi three, and chi four, but chi four is equal to chi one. So we call this the degenerate case. This is not just some random Simplification, it has some, <coughs> this case has some, is quite significant. Um, so, so, okay, maybe I'll start saying it now. So the, you remember there were two propositions, proposition one and proposition two. Proposition one was the, the long one that I proved yesterday, and proposition two was proved by Alexander using quadratic forms, Albert forms. And th that is, what this theorem tells us is that that is easier. The, the proposition two is easier. We can, we can give a, a proof using only formal Hilbert 90 of this proposition. And because, because the key point is if you have proposition, that proposition, then you, you can already do the degenerate case. That's the case when A is equal to D, right? Then you cannot do, what you cannot do is the reduction to A equals D. That's exactly the proposition of yesterday, okay? Okay, so, but I should say, um, so something about the proof of this. So the, there is a, the proof is, is a, has an important idea, so, um, so the key idea for the proof is to, is to introduce a, a new notion um, of Hilbert 90 module. So I want to explain this uh, next. Um, so, okay. Um, so I want to consider, I will call S, um, Q uh, mod ZP1. So, okay, what is this? So, as an abelian group, S is just Q mod ZP. This should be localization. So, localization of P. So, it's a P power torsion abelian group. And gamma acts on, 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 on S. Uh, well, first you do the, whoops, first you do the, you use theta. And then you let the ZP cross act on Q mod ZP, right? And, but just by multiplication. And the point is that, so th these elements here are series in powers of P, right? Uh, powers of P, but if you have some element in here, it will be some A over P to the N. You only care about the powers all the way to P to the N. The other powers don't affect the outcome of the multiplication. So this is a... Exactly, yeah, but yeah, we kept it. Smaller, yeah, but it's exactly the same thing, yeah. yeah. Um, so in other words, S is the co-limit 
it's the union of all of the torsion, all of its torsion, uh, p-power torsion, and um, we can write this as colimit of zp to the n one. Okay, so zp is is the limit of these, but this is the colimit. Okay. Okay, so, so what is the Hilbert 90 module? Well, here's the definition. So definition. Okay. So Hilbert 90, uh, suppose that our, we have our pair, gamma theta, which is p-oriented. So p-oriented profinite group. Um, so a Hilbert 90 module. for uh, gamma theta is, um, well, is a, a discrete, so it's a discrete gamma module M such that, so three properties. The first property is M is P divisible. The second property is the p, the p power torsion of M is isomorphic to S as a as a gamma module. S is defined in the other board, and three. Um, Hilbert ninety holds for M, so uh, H one gamma prime M. Uh, I mean Hilbert ninety holds for the gamma module M, so H one of gamma prime M is zero for every gamma prime open subgroup of gamma. Okay, so of course, what is, this definition is inspired by the example of absolute Galois groups. Let's just do the characteristic not P case. So characteristic not P. Um, so we have our, we have a, the absolute Galois group of F and the cyclotomic character. And in this case, I can just take the F sep, F sep star. So this is this is silver ninety module. Okay. So uh, since p since um, p is prime to the characteristic, this is uh, p divisible. Um, the torsion is just the, the roots of unity. So it's exactly it's. Uh, it's, it's the union of all the mu p to the n, so it's, n, uh, it's s. And then 3 is, is just the Hilbert 90 for all fields extensions of f. So if you take n module s, that has no higher terminology. Yeah, yes. Um, I guess at least, um, at least h1. Yeah, but, yeah, but we, uh, yeah. Yeah, you will see in the construction, we will see the quotient, yeah. If I have time to do the construction. Um, Okay, so what, what's the point of this? Um, maybe first let me explain how this is used. Um, exactly. So. So remember, the, the goal for, is to tell you the key idea for the proof of the theorem of uh, the theorem up there, right? So prove massive vanishing conjecture in this more general setting. So formal Hilbert 90 setting. And the key point, so I've given this definition of Hilbert 90 module, the key point is that they always exist w when, when formal Hilbert 90 holds. So theorem. So we take our gamma theta. As always, it's our p oriented profinite group. Then um, gamma theta satisfies formal Hilbert 90 if and only if, if and only if uh, uh, gamma theta has or admits a Hilbert 90 module. Okay? So, 
So in other words, if we want to prove that theorem, we can, we can pick a Hilbert 90 module, and then we can try to mimic, mimic, mimic our Galois cohomology proofs using this Hilbert 90 module. So let's see. Maybe I want to first I say something about the proof of this theorem, and then we go back to, then I tell you how it's used. Um, Can't I just choose S? Well, but S won't have this third condition, right? By Kummer theory, this will be oh, non-zero. So basically, you need to enlarge S so that you kill this. Uh, yeah, yeah. So maybe I'll just, since you brought it up, I'll just sketch the construction, which is formal. So some some formal homology, pure algebra construction, and in particular, it does not recover F sub star. It gives us a new Hilbert 90 module even in the case of absolute Galois groups. I will just give a so proof of this. Um, OK, so this, first of all, this side is obvious. It's just as, ob as easy as the proof over fields. You just take your proof over, fi over fields that, um, um, right, so yeah, so you basically you just, you just use, yeah, I guess the key point is this. You, you, you have this sequence. Thanks to, uh, thanks to these conditions, you have sur this gives you surjectivity of multiplication by P2D, and this gives you exactly that the, the kernel is, is that. And so then you take homology. Mm. OK, so the other part of the proof requires a construction, right? You, you know that gamma theta satisfies formal Hilbert 90. Um, And you, you will need to you, you need to um, to, prove, to give the construction of, of some gamma module. Okay. Um, so okay, let's go. So we, I start by defining X to be this abelian group um, homomorphisms from the abelian group Q uh, to co-cycles. Okay, this is the, the inhomogeneous co-cycles. I take all, this, all the homomorphisms. And then um, I, take, I define Q to be the, the Q vector space generated by, spanned by co-cycles. So, sorry, by element of X, elements of X. So for every X in X, I, I will choose some UX. Sorry, it's the basis element corresponding to X. So I get this huge abelian group, which is uniquely divisible. And then I will define M to be uh, S direct sum with Q, OK? So what I'm going to, OK, I need to tell you an action. So for now, it's a, that, that direct sum is as an abelian group. But it will not be a direct sum as a gamma module. So I'm going to give you the action. Okay, so what is the action? Right, so G dot um, S Q U X, right, so this Q is in Q, S is in S, G is in gamma, so this will be defined as theta G times S plus X of Q. So now this is X of, um, X is a homomorphism from Q to Z1, so this is now an element of Z1. That means it's a co-cycle. I, I can apply G and get an element of S. Uh, and then I, QX doesn't change. Okay, so that's my, my action. You have to check it's an action. Um, and then, well, what is immediate is that M is P divisible, and, all, and also that the P primary torsion of M is, is S. That's just by definition. These are abelian group facts, right? Um, yeah, OK. For, for this, I guess it, it's also important to, to notice that we have this sequence, right? So, so, this, uh, so we have this sequence. Uh, this is a sequence of gamma modules. And it's, it's uh, split as a sequence of abelian groups, but it's not split as a sequence of gamma modules. But in any case, S is 
there's a natural way to identify S inside M in, in, as a gamma module, and that gives us the pre-primary pre torsion. Okay, so if we take homology here, we get H1 gamma S, H1 gamma M, and then we get the cohomology of a, of a uniquely divisible group, so that's zero. Um, so now, all, all it remains to, to show that this is zero, that's what we want, at least that's part of what we want. We need to, we need to show that this map is zero. So let's take some cocycle, Z, and let us see that it becomes a co-boundary, so a co-cycle of S, and let's see that it becomes a co-cycle in M, uh, a co-boundary in M. So I take some Z in Z1 gamma S, then if I, th if I um, think of Z as, um, so okay, what, uh, what I wanna do, so uh, um, I wanna consider this, so I wanna consider this in uh, the class, I guess, of this in gamma M, and I wanna show it is zero, right? Okay, so how do I do this? Well, I consider the homomorphism from, from the integers to, um, to the cocycles corresponding to z, so I send one to, to little z. Okay, now, um, I have erased the condition, but since, um, remember for Hilbert 90, uh, if uh, gamma theta satisfies formal Hilbert 90, we have surjectivity for uh, p, p to the n torsion for, for every n, uh, surjectivity of the reduction maps for every n at the level of co-cycles not just cohomology. So this means that this, this group is, uh, is divisible. This is a divisible group. So here, it means I can extend this to a homomorphism from Q to, to Z, Z1. And I will call this X, because it's an element of a, of a big X. Um, okay, so now what is, um, let us compute for, for some g in gamma, what is, what is g minus one of this? This is just um, x, you just, look at the, you just look at the formula there, it's x of one comma, sorry, x of one of g comma, comma zero. Right, this is g, g of this minus this. You get this y cancels out here. So what is this? This is exactly, by this diagram, what is x of one? x of one is z. So this is z of g, zero, okay? So this, this means that the image of z in M, as a cos I think of, g, of z as a co-cycle in M, it's a, it's a co-boundary. So then the class is zero in H1 gamma. Okay, so this, map, this means that this map is zero and so this group has to be zero. So I proved the, Ilber, the, the con conclusion three just for gamma. Okay, now there's an argument. You have this for gamma, so you have it also for every open subgroup. You kind of put all, all of these together and you get a common M for all, for all the subgroups. Okay, so let's go back to, to, to the proof of this. Now we have, so in, we have this Hilbert 90 module, so, but why is it so useful? The point is that once we have a Hilbert 90 module, we can do, we can do um, what we could do using just uh, the multiplicative group. So I will just give some examples. Uh, for example, we have, suppose that you have A, B in your Hilbert 90 module, then you know that we can prove that A, B is zero if and only if there exists some alpha in M gamma A, that would be the kernel uh, of the character corresponding to A, such that the norm of alpha is B. Okay, that's one property, and then we all, I can also give you another one. So if, if we have M in alpha in gamma, M gamma A, then the norm of alpha is zero, if and only if, uh, um, alpha is equal to g minus one uh, theta 
where, where G, G is a generator of, uh, so, a generator of the quotient group, which is cyclic of order P, and, um, and theta is in M gamma A. So the first thing we used many times yesterday, and the second thing is just Hilbert 90 for cyclic Galois extensions of order P. Right, but just rephrase using Hilbert 90 modules. And there are many more properties that you can re reformulate and reprove for M. Basically a property which only deals with multiplication. You can handle things where you, you mix multiplication and addition, they kind of fall out of the scope of this. And this is why the proof using quadratic forms, Albert forms and all that needs to be reworked. But there is a way to do this. There's a way to do this, yeah. Yes, uh, yeah, that's an important point. I must have written it. Um, oh, here. Uh, here, yes. Yeah, I said it, but I should have written it. Yeah, thanks. So formal Hilbert 90 gives us that if I go from sp to the n plus 1 to sp to the n, that's surjective. A priori only for cohomology, but in fact for cocycles. That's a lemma that you can prove. And th now this is the... This is the union of those, so it's, it's a divisible. It means you can go from every, every cocycle will factor through some sp to the n, so you, and then you factor, you can, you can divide by p, thanks to, this, uh, thanks to this lemma. So here's the key point where we use the assumption. I guess, yeah, they're like, yeah, they're like, yeah. This is what I have, exactly. You, you can prove x minus x is zero also. Oh. You cannot prove that x one minus x is zero. I mean, you cannot even state it, because yeah. what is one minus? Yeah. 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 And this is, but this for us is good enough. This is what we used yesterday all the time, this replace, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Okay, great. So that's, that's all I wanted to say about uh, formal Hilbert 90. Okay, now, in the remaining time, I want to discuss a, a different topic, which is an application of massy products to a question which uh, uh, can be, can be of okay, is also interesting in the topological setting, uh, so, namely formality of DGAs. So, formality of Galois cohomology. Okay, so okay, so I, I need to talk about arbitrary DG, DG rings now. Um, just, I just want to say that for DG rings, massy products still exist. That's the the upshot. But first, let me mention this formality notion. So definition: uh, suppose that A is a differential graded ring. Um, so we say that is a formal, so a DGR A is formal if basically all the information about the DGA, the DG ring, is contained in its cohomology. So if more precisely, if there exists some DGR B and, and a roof uh, of quasi-isomorphisms, which link A to its cohomology. Uh, so A is our DG ring, B is another DG ring, the cohomology is just a graded ring. We think of it as a DG ring with zero differential. Okay, so as I said, informally this means that all the information about um, A is already contained in the cohomology, right? It's already contained in the cup product. Um, okay, so this is related this is also quasi isomorphism. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. So if there exists such a thing. Okay. Um, so, okay, in general, if you have an arbitrary DG ring, um, you, ha you, you have massy products. So for all n, at least two, and a1, an, elements of h1, 
you can you can always define massy products. Okay, so it's an element. It's a subset of H two. Sorry. Um, and by the theorem of Dwyer that Alexander mentioned in, in lecture one. Whatever this definition is, it's a, I, I don't write it down because it's a, there are some maybe complicated, slightly complicated indices to keep track of. But this definition, thanks to Dwyer, is the same as the one we've been using in the case of group cohomology. Okay. We'll define a notion of massive products which could be, could be empty. Yeah, I agree. And then the massive product is defined if it's non-empty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in any, we still have the. We still have that the ma massive product is a generalization of the cup product, and we still have, for n at least three, our properties an, bn, and cn. So the massive product vanishes, is defined, or the cup products, the consecutive cup products are zero. And just like uh, in the case of group cohomology, we have these implications an implies bn implies cn. OK, so what is the relation to formality? Well, it's the following lemma. Suppose that your, that your DG ring A is formal. Then, then these implications are actually equivalences. So then CN implies AN for all N at least 3. OK, you can re reverse everything. So this is. In particular, the massy conjecture would hold for A, right? BN implies AN, but it's much stronger. So CN even implies AN. And in fact, this property is called strong massy vanishing. OK. OK, so here's the, right? here's the, the relation. Formality implies a strong massy vanishing. So the question of Hopkins and, and Wickelgren from from 2015 is the following. So um, is the um, co the um, co complex of um, gamma f um, formal for all f and for all p, OK? If, I guess if you want, if you're worried about having a piece root of unity, you can assume there Take the question, assuming that there is a piece root of unity. Um, so what is the motivation for this question? My understanding is that their motivation is, um, at, well, at the time, Bloccato had conjecture had been proved. And Bloccato conjecture tells you that the cohomology of gamma f is, is very easy. It's, it's a quadratic algebra. And so, so they, want, they want to go, go further. Not only the, the cochain complex is easy with respect to the cup product, but it's also easy with respect to higher cup products, so with respect to massy products. Basically, there's nothing else. Um, there's really nothing else other than the cup product. So that this would mean the absolute Gala groups are very, very special um, within the class of profinite groups. So that was the question. Unfortunately, they were not aware of a previous counterexample to this, to this very question due to Positselsky, where the fields are actually very small. So. Um, Positselsky, 2011, he proved that, um, so, um, well, let's take, I, I want to give you the, the exact example. So we take a prime L, which is not P, and F, a finite extension of either Laurent series um, or QL. OK, and we suppose that there is a piece root of unity in F. And if it, it oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. Thanks, yeah. And um, you need, so piece root of unity if, um, so you need a piece root of unity. When piece two, you also need a fourth root of unity. Um, so then, he proved that the, 
the cohomology DGA is not form. Uh, okay, so even though the cohomology is very simple, the the cohomology the cochain DGA is not form. So let me make a remark about this. So this does not contradict the massive vanishing conjecture because we only have an implication. So if, in fact, we know then the massive vanishing conjecture holds for local fields. In general, it holds for the Mushkin groups. Um, and so this is my first remark, so no contradiction here. And another key point here, so another key point is that that there are, um, that the cyclotomic character is non-trivial. So crucial that the cyclotomic character is non-trivial. In fact, you cannot find an example like this. Let's just consider power series. So you cannot find an example, a counterexample, a Positelsky counterexample of this form if k contains all roots of unity. Because, because the, uh, what is the absolute Gara group? Well, let's take the maximal pro p quotient. This is zp cross gamma k. So if, if the action is a trivial, this is a direct product, and yeah, it's, um, you, you're not going to get anywhere with, with such a simple modification of the original group. You, so the, this works because the action here is non-trivial in Posizelski's example. OK, so this is very important. Yes, exactly. So the, yeah. Exactly, yes. Yeah. yeah, and the action is exactly the psychotomic character. Okay, so this motivated the question of Positelsky, which is a refinement of um, Hopkins and Wickelgren's question. So is there well, I guess it's a, I will phrase it as, a, as, as the negative, but. So is there a field containing all roots of unity such that the cohomology DGA is uh, not formal? Yeah. OK, so for, for Positelsky, Positelsky's example, it's crucial to have to, that you don't have all roots of unity. You need one, but. No, uh, you need piece roots of unity, but not all of them. Um, so, and the, so then the question is, what if you have all roots of unity? Is this non-formality just related to a non-trivial psychotomic character, or is there, is there more to it? OK, so let us, uh, yeah. so let us see further examples. So there's, there's basically one more example. Um, it's the example of Arpaz and Wittenberg. So the question here was posed in 2017, and the answer is also 2017, I think. Or, um, so we just take F to be the rational numbers. And we take p equals 2. OK, so then um, I will consider the following cup products. So 34, 2, uh, uh, 2, 17, and 17, 34. So you can check that these are 0 in the Brouwer group of q. So these are two torsion classes. They're all 0. Um, so um, on the other hand, uh, so but if you take 34, uh, 2, 17, and 34, this, is, this massive product is not defined. OK, and as, and as a conclusion, uh, gamma q, or the cohomology of gamma q mod 2, is not formal. Okay, 
So th this is in contrast to Poziselski's example, where massive vanishing conjecture holds actually even strong massive vanishing holds. Here, strong massive vanishing fails, and as a consequence, by that lemma, um, yeah, by that lemma, uh, the cohomology DJ is not formal. Okay, so with, with Alexander, we generalize this theorem, this example, uh, to an arbitrary field. So what, what is the special property of these numbers? Well, if you call 2B and 17C, then 34 is BC. So it's a degenerate massive product. The first and last term are equal, but it's a double degeneration because they're also equal to, they're also in the multiplicative span of the middle, the middle terms. Right, so this is exactly the thing that we looked at. So theorem. So we take, again, p equals 2, and the characteristic is not 2. And then we consider, well, we take two elements, b, c, in f, star, and then the following are equivalent. So the first. Uh, the first property is uh, BC, BC, BC vanishes. The second property is it's defined. Okay, nothing new here. This is just the massive vanishing conjecture in the double, in a very special situation. For it. And three, this is the important, uh, the, the important condition. Um, BC is equal to zero in the Brouwer group of F. And um, this uh, very strange condition, minus 1 is a norm from BC. OK? So this, in particular, recovers the Arpas-Wittenberg example. You can, you can use some, a little bit of number theory to check this condition. And, but this works over any field. So you get. You, you, you can get more examples this way. Um, so on the other hand, it doesn't answer Poziselski's question. So not a counter, uh, does not answer, <coughs> does, does not answer Poziselski. Poziselski's question. Indeed, suppose that you, you have a, an eighth root of unity. For Poziselski's question, we would need all, all two power roots of unity. Suppose you have even just the eighth root of unity, then minus one is indeed the norm of this root of unity. Right, this is an extension of degree four, so you're multiplying this by, by you're, you're doing z8 to the, to the four. So, so. So then it's defined, right? We need an example where it's not defined to answer Poziselski's question. Yeah, I think it's fine. Yeah. OK, so, so this doesn't answer Poziselski's question. So nevertheless, another theorem answers Poziselski's question. That's the next one. So. Um, Theorem. Okay, so here's the theorem. For every prime P and for every F, field F of characteristic not P, um, there exists some L larger than F, so some field extension of F. Uh, such that um, the cohomology DGA is not formal. Okay, so maybe cohomology of F is formal, but if you pass to an extension, it is not. Okay, so this answers um, Poziselski's question. Um, so more, let me let me state this theorem more precisely. So, so more precisely, we will take, we take L to be F. OK, we are joining a pth root of unity, if necessary. Then I take two variables over, over F 
x and y to uh, algebraically independent variables. And then I take the function field of x, so what is x, um, where x is the severi Brauer variety Brauer variety of x, y. OK? So this, this means that, um, well, x doesn't have any, any rational points, but in fact, if you, if you go to, to the algebraic closure of L, it will become isomorphic to projective space of dimension p minus 1. OK? So it's, it's a form of projective space of dimension p minus 1. OK, so this is our field. So it's a pretty small field. It's some function field over f. Um, and um, what are, what are um, OK, so then I define a to be x. No, 1 minus x. a is 1 minus x. b is x. Uh, C is y, and um, D is uh, 1 minus y. Okay. Okay, so then um, we have the cup, these cup products are, are all zero over in the bar group of L. So let us say y. Well, the fact that 1 minus x, x is 0, that's already true over f. It's a Steinberg rela uh, relation. Sorry, over f. It's true over f of x, y. That's the Steinberg relation. Same for c, d. Uh, so maybe I'll just, I'll just write it here. So in general, u, 1 minus u is always 0. This is the Steinberg relation. OK, now in general, of course, xy is some, it's the generic quaternion al um, cyclic algebra of uh, degree p, so it's, it's not trivial. But if you, it's a general fact that if you pass to the function field of the severi Brouwer uh, variety uh, of xy, then xy does become 0. So bc becomes 0 over L. On the other hand, the massy product a, b, c, d is not defined. OK, so, so the theorem, so the, what we proved is, is in fact that strong massive vanishing fails, right? And as a consequence, formality also fails. OK, so this answers Posizelsky's uh, question. OK, in the last five minutes, I'll try to uh, sketch very briefly the, the main ideas of the, of the proof. OK, so let me just assume, I don't want to carry around the piece root of unity, so let me just assume it's in F. And now the st there are two, two steps. So the first step is to, um, so remember, A, B, C, D being defined, that's the same thing as the homomorphism um, chi A, chi B, chi C, and chi D. Uh, The, this homomorphism lifts to u5 bar, right? So, so for, for this step, let me just take some, let's just work over f. So let me just take a, b, c, d in f. OK, so the massy product a, b, c, d is defined if and only if you have a u5 bar extension of f, a, b, c, d. OK, so we need. Um, so what we do is we need to we we want to turn this into a pure algebra purely algebra problem. So we're going to parameterize all the possible liftings. So this is possible because um, because because basically n is n is uh, sufficiently small. Already, if you wanted to do this with five, you would run into problems. But since if n is four, we can use this uh, trick. I'm gonna. What does it mean to have a u5 uh, bar lift? It's the same as having a u4 lift, upper u4 lift, a lower u4 lift, 
which agree in the common U3 square. So, um, so, so uh, U5 bar left, if and only if a U4 left, let's call it U4 plus, so the upper U4, a U4 minus left, and then an isomorphism, uh, an isomorphism, an isomorphism of, of the induced U3 lifts corresponding to this middle square. And this gives you this condition. So all in all, you, you, so we, this, this requires a lot of work, but you eventually get to, to this condition. There exists some W in FBC star such that sigma B uh, minus one, sigma C minus one W is equal to, the, to your piece root of unity. And then there are V in FAC star and, um, sorry, U, U in FAC star and the V in FBD star such that the norm, norm A of U, norm D of V is equal to uh, W to the P. So roughly, very roughly speaking, the U corresponds to the upper square, the V corresponds to the bottom square, and the W is the datum of an isomorphism. So this is very rough. Okay, so but the point, so now we, so now we get, we get this condition. So now we need to, we need to show that these things don't exist. Exactly, so this is over, this first step is over an arbitrary field. If you wanna know if, if ABCD over some field is, is not defined or defined, this is what you have to compute, exactly. So now there is a, in fact there is a, a with a tiny bit of calculation, you can replace this by a for all. So it, in, in other words, it doesn't matter which W you choose. If, if this thing works for one W, it will work for any other W. So you're allowed to fix your W. Um, so a priori that's stronger, but in fact it's equivalent. And so all of this to say that basically what we have to deal, what we deal with is the following. Um, so we have T over F is the torus given by the following equation. So UV such that the norm of U times the norm of V is equal to one. So this is a torus over F. And then we have uh, a torsor for this torus. So we have, um, so we, 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 we choose a specific W in our L, um, specific, such that sigma B minus one, sigma C minus one is, is, a, is a Z, P. And this you can do because this, because basically because this is almost projective space, so you can, you can do some explicit calculation. And final, final line, so now we have our W. So we get our, we need to solve the equations. Uh, this norm is equal to W to, this is equal to W to the P, and this is ZP. Um, this is just a torsor for this torus. So we obtain a torsor, EW, T torsor, TFX torsor. So the torus is defined over F, but the torsor is defined only over, over L, okay? And we wanna show that this EW is, is non-trivial, non-split. And for this, there is a, so this is a very nice setup because it stores us under a torus over a, over a function field. So the first thing you can check is if it's ramified or not. And it turns out if it was ramified, then we would be done. But in fact, it's unramified. So no luck there. But on the other hand, there is a secondary abstraction which only applies to unramified torsor, torsors, obstruction. And this is, this is a purely homological algebra fact. You can construct this obstruction and um, this is non-zero. So non-zero on EW. So there, there's a whole machinery to compute these things that we set up and then we compute it. We show that this invariant is non-trivial. So the torso is not split. So the massive product is not defined. And so the, the galo homology is not formal. Okay, I'll stop here, thank you.